Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. I just want to take a few minutes to talk to you about what is the core from which everything emanates in the context of us as a people and this as a house. Um, there's a wonderful story of a, of a young man who was born into privilege. His, his, his father was uh, the son that would inherit and his grandfather was actually the king. And um, in that environment of, of, of privilege, you would have thought that the life of this young man um, would be something to be envied because our concept would be one of how perfect can it get. However, this young man one day had both his father and his grandfather tragically killed in a place where probably they shouldn't have been, doing something they probably shouldn't have been doing. And suddenly this boy, in the midst of privilege, finds himself having to deal with the loss of his father and his grandfather. You see, the issue is that the benefits of life do not protect us from the issues of life. And uh, I often hear people tell me, particularly in church life, oh, I talked to this person. Uh, and so and so and so and so, but they're really okay, you know. Let me tell you something, nobody is okay. On the outward, you looked at this boy's situation, and it looked great. But underneath was all this grief, all this anxiety, all of this pain. And not only was that the case, but when the news that his father and his grandfather had been killed got back to the home where he was staying, he realized that in that context he was now very vulnerable because we're going back now into history in the long off days in which the Bible was written. And so now his life, instead of being one of privilege, he now found himself something of a fugitive. And here's what the story says, that, that the, 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 the nursemaid who was looking after him, the nanny, picked him up realizing we need to get out of here because where your father and your grandfather have been killed, those people might come looking for us. And as she was taking him out of the house, she stumbled and she dropped him. And he finished up disabled. He damaged his legs to the point where he was now crippled and could no longer walk. See, there are some wonderful issues to this story, which is not only is there nobody in the world who's okay, but all of us at some time, by someone in some situation, have been dropped. Whether you were dropped by a friend, dropped by a husband, dropped by a wife, dropped by a mother and father who you never felt really loved you and you could never do enough to please them, dropped by a company, dropped by a job, dropped by a friend, dropped by an establishment, and all of us, to some degree, may not be physically disabled, but every one of us, somewhere in the depths of our heart, our emotions, our psyche, our social existence, have suffered damage because somewhere we got dropped in life. The wonder about this story is that there was a guy called David, and David actually was the one who took the throne after this young boy's grandfather had been killed. And it was interesting, the story of David, the one who took the throne, because this boy's grandfather had always hated this boy, David, and had part of his life appreciated him, but then felt threatened and felt jealous, and then made every attempt that he could to kill David, to take David off the scene, to take him out of the picture. And, uh, and so that, that's, that's the situation that was that was happening there, and, 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 yet, and yet this David said, is there anybody left 
of the household of that king that I can be kind to. There's two things that it says. Is there anyone left of the house of Saul, who was the previous king, to whom I can show kindness for his son's sake, who was David's friend? And then another verse says, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? God's kindness. We all need help from outside, our own ability and resources. Everybody does. I don't buy it that the, the community that we try to reach don't need anything that we're offering. I would say quite the opposite. The community that we're trying to reach need everything that we are offering. He got dropped, it left him damaged, wounded, disabled. I was watching the TV the other night with Chris and I was watching a program on the SAS. Some of you know what the SAS is, the Special Air Service. That's our, that's our premium undercover secret part of the army that we send all over the world doing all kinds of things that you and I have no idea about. Uh, and in essence, they're very brave men, but they're trained killers. And one of these SAS soldiers was telling his story. He said, my mother left me at birth in a Harrods bag on the steps of a hospital. Now, some of you know, just because you're in a Harrods bag doesn't make that okay. It doesn't make it feel better because you got put in a Harrods bag. He probably had reasons for going into the SAS and killing people, you think? You think there might have just been a hint of need for fixing this because he got dropped. He got disabled, not in his body, not in his feet, in his heart, in his life, in his mind, in his spirit. Left him. There are a thousand stories like that that you will never hear. Not necessarily as a baby left in a Harrods bag, but a thousand stories of how people got dropped how people got damaged, and how people need something beyond their own resources and ability to restore in their lives what it is that has been lost. I don't buy the outward mask. I look for what's going on in the heart. So this guy David asked where he was, and he actually had this boy brought to the palace and said to him, don't be afraid. He said three wonderful things that I share with you tonight. I will surely show you kindness. That was the first thing. How nice when you're not sure that anybody cares that you have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and work out your own anger by beating somebody else to a pulp or solve your own value by becoming self-centered and a huge success how wonderful when somebody else says, I will surely show you kindness. That's the core of this house. He says, I will restore you. A lot of what our Saturday nights are going to be is showing you kindness and restoring you. He said this, and you will always eat at my table, a privileged place. But you see, it's more than just having a privileged place and being invited to eat at David the king's table. First of all, it meant that you were actually being treated like the king's son, not like some outsider, not like somebody that the wind blew in off the street, but actually somebody who belongs at the table that's been prepared for you. And it says he always ate at the king's table, even though he was crippled in both feet, but I want you to get the picture. This boy's crippled, and this is symbolic, okay? It's symbolic, he's crippled. That's, that's where his damage has shown up. But the king in kindness invites him to come and sit at his table. Why does he do that? Because when we sit at the table, we all look the same. You can't see what's going on under the table. You can only see 
the person as they are. This is a table we come to that does not expose our disabilities. It covers our disabilities. And we are unified in receiving the provision that is on the table. Everybody gets the same. It's what's on the table, not what's under it, that becomes the focus of our attention and the goal of our being. And in this house, what we're going to call you to now, to our table, and why we want you to pull up a chair is because it's not what's under the table that becomes our focus of attention, but it's, what is the, it's what's on the table that is the goal of our being to serve you. That's why this guy David wrote a psalm, a poem that you'll probably all be familiar with. He said, you prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies. But Jesus declared as his friends and prepares a table for us. Not in the presence of our enemies, but it's the presence of his friends. And so before we come to share something, this is very important to where we're moving as a house. Jesus moves the epicenter of God's kingdom from the exclusivity of a temple to the inclusivity of a table. Jesus was not temple obsessed, he was table obsessed. He didn't end his life by saying, come on boys, you've all got to come to the temple. He said, come on boys, why don't you come and sit at the table? Because when we're at the table, we all look the same. When we're in the temple, we don't because it's an exclusive system that says unless you've washed this way, eaten this way, dressed this way, acted this way, you can only come so far. But at the table, there's no restriction. We get right to Jesus himself when we come to the table. His objective is not the rebuilding of the religious temple system and nor is ours, but the establishing of a table celebration. And in that spirit, we invite you to pull up a chair. We empower you to invite the whole world to pull up a chair. We tell you that the gospel is a pull up a chair gospel. Because the table is still set, it's still prepared, and whoever comes and eats, whoever comes and drinks, receives the very life of God himself, favoring you in a way that you could have never imagined. This was that young boy's response to David when he saw such kindness. How can you show such kindness to me who is just a dog? In other words, his view was, I don't qualify. My grandfather tried to kill you. I'm not part of your family. I'm separate to you, but you have treated me as though I am your closest friend and your own child. The whole spirit that we are driving on of welcome to our house and pull up a chair is because we are setting a table at which we all look the same. And we invite you, if people can't pull up a chair for themselves, pull one up for them. And let them know, with all the hidden things, all the disabilities, all the things that happen to us because we were dropped, there is a table that we can sit at where there is no condemnation, we all look the same, but we receive a feast and we don't leave the same that we came. So the message changes from are you worthy, which is the temple message, to pull up a chair, and if you can't, we'll pull one up for you. You need to know that in our forward momentum, we are here to bless and not to curse. You're not going to hear much bad news, if any at all. We are here to bless and not to curse so that you can also bless and not curse. So through our wake-up statements on the video, which you have seen, to our welcome statements on our banners, which 50% of the men will need to notice and then read as you go out, we are making clear our ground zero as a house from this point on. We are declaring the focal point and what emanates out from there. And so what better way could there be 
to bring our proceedings tonight to something of a conclusion, we're going to let you see the video again, than to invite you to come as best we can celebrate it to the table. And in doing that, we are going to share communion. Um, you don't have to have been confirmed. You don't have to be the oldest person since Pope Paul. You don't have to have a sainthood. It's pull up a chair, right? Symbolically as you come, whatever the disabilities, whatever the damage, whatever has happened to you, whatever has been the wounds of life, when you come to this table, we all look the same. And we all get the same, which means that in this bread there is life, and in this wine there is life. And when you receive it, you receive life. And so we are going to invite you to come tonight. And be served, we're going to do it as quickly and as orderly as we can. Chris and I and Jenny are going to serve you the bread. And then when you've been served the bread, if you would like to take, it's not wine, it's a juice. We didn't want to be in a position of anybody who's got some alcohol issues or whatever. So we, we've, just, we've, we've just provided juice, it's okay. Yeah, and if you are a gluten-free person, we even have gluten-free communion bread. How, how, how immense is that? So please, if you come, when you come, please tell us if you're gluten-free so we can serve you with, with the gluten-free bread. So what we will do when we begin is Chris is going to stand over here, and I'm going to stand in the middle, and Jenny's going to stand over here. And as we invite you to come, the stewards will help you. We're going to start on the left side over there, and have you guys come. The stewards are going to help you. And then when you've come by, we'll do the same thing, but we're sort of having a one-way system. So if the stewards are sending you that way, they're not telling you to go home. Okay? <laughs> what they're doing is telling you to go through the back so you can come back up this side, or here, through the back, so you can come back up that side, or here, through the back, down the side there, so you can come up this side. That will just help the flow so we don't have masses coming and masses going back all at once. Is that clear? Okay? So on this side, we'll start where Claire is. Here, we'll start here. And there, we'll start where Graham is. And then as you come, we want to speak a blessing over you as we give you the bread. And, uh, and then, as I've said, I'd like to invite you to drink the, drink the juice, the wine, the symbol of the wine, right? where they are, and you can put your glass back or whatever. I don't care. Take it home if you... <laughs> we really just want you to be blessed and just want you to receive. Now, here's, here's, here's what I would like to believe, that as you come and receive, you are affirming what we have declared tonight. That's your affirmation. I myself am coming to the table. I am pulling up a chair in our house believing that the blessing of God is upon me, that my, my, my damage, whatever's damaged, is under the table, that we look the same, but as I come and receive, the life of God is going to touch my life. The life that Jesus promised. This is the bread of life. And this is wine of a new promise. That's the thing. Jesus said it's a new covenant. That means a new promise. Some of you like a new promise to explode in your life. When you drink this juice, Jesus said, this declares that you believe there is a new promise in your life as well. So we're going to receive that. And uh, as we do it, we will bless you. And the guys are just going to play gently because he's a good, good father. That's who he is. Okay, we're not resting on, on David's act today. The Bible calls Jesus great David's greatest son. We're resting on what Jesus did, because what David did was for one person at one time in one place. But what Jesus did was for all people, for all time, in all places. But we come, and as we receive, we are blessed, and we are restored, and we are released. So we want to invite you to come, and the stewards will help us, and we'll serve you and bless you, and then we'll tell you how we're going to finish up. All right, Pete, you can start and come in. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others. <laughs>